Part three, chapter five of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part three, chapter five on interior humility to you however my daughter i would teach a deeper humility for that of which i have been speaking is almost more truly to be called worldly wisdom than humility there are some persons who dare not or will not think about the graces with which god has endowed them fearing lest they should become self-complacent and vainglorious but they are quite wrong for if as the angelic doctor says the real way of attaining to the love of god is by a careful consideration of all his benefits given to us then the better we realize these the more we shall love him and inasmuch as individual gifts are more acceptable than general gifts so they ought to be more specially dwelt upon of a truth nothing so tends to humble us before the mercy of god as the multitude of his gifts to us just as nothing so tends to humble us before his justice as the multitude of our misdeeds let us consider what he has done for us and what we have done contrary to his will and as we review our sins in detail so let us review his grace in the same there is no fear that a perception of what he has given you will puff you up so long as you keep steadily in mind that whatever is good in you is not of yourself do mules cease to be clumsy stinking beasts because they are used to carry the dainty treasures and perfumes of a prince what hast thou that thou didst not receive now if thou didst receive it why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it on the contrary a lively appreciation of the grace given to you should make you humble for appreciation begets gratitude but if when realizing the gifts god has given you any vanity should beset you the infallible remedy is to turn to the thought of all our ingratitude imperfection and weakness any one who will calmly consider what he has done without god cannot fail to realize that what he has done with god is no merit of his own and so we may rejoice in that which is good in us and take pleasure in the fact but we shall give all the glory to god alone who alone is its author it was in this spirit that the blessed virgin confessed that god had done great things to her only that she might humble herself and exalt him my soul doth magnify the lord she said by reason of the gifts he had given her we are very apt to speak of ourselves as naught as weakness itself as the off-scouring of the earth but we should be very much vexed to be taken at our word and generally considered what we call ourselves on the contrary we often make believe to run away and hide ourselves merely to be followed and sought out we pretend to take the lowest place with the full intention of being honourably called to come up higher but true humility does not affect to be humble and is not given to make a display in lowly words it seeks not only to conceal other virtues but above all it seeks and desires to conceal itself and if it were lawful to tell lies or feign or give scandal humility would perhaps sometimes affect a cloak of pride in order to hide itself utterly take my advice my daughter and either use no professions of humility or else use them with a real mind corresponding to your outward expressions never cast down your eyes without humbling your heart and do not pretend to wish to be last and least unless you really and sincerely mean it i would make this so general a rule as to have no exception only courtesy sometimes requires us to put forward those who obviously would not put themselves forward but this is not deceitful or mock humility and so with respect to certain expressions of regard which do not seem strictly true but which are not dishonest because the speaker really intends to give honour and respect 
to him to whom they are addressed and even though the actual words may be somewhat excessive there is no harm in them if they are the ordinary forms of society though truly i wish that all our expressions were as nearly as possible regulated by real heart feeling in all truthfulness and simplicity a really humble man would rather that some one else called him worthless and good for nothing than say so of himself at all events if such things are said he does not contradict them but acquiesces contentedly for it is his own opinion we meet people who tell us that they leave mental prayer to those who are more perfect not feeling themselves worthy of it that they dare not communicate frequently because they do not feel fit to do so that they fear to bring discredit on religion if they profess it through their weakness and frailty while others decline to use their talents in the service of god and their neighbour because forsooth they know their weakness and are afraid of becoming proud if they do any good thing lest while helping others they might destroy themselves but all this is unreal and not merely a spurious but a vicious humility which tacitly and secretly condemns god's gifts and makes a pretext of lowliness while really exalting self-love self-sufficiency indolence and evil tempers ask thee a sign of the lord thy god ask it either in the depth or in the height above so spake the prophet to king ahaz but he answered i will not ask neither will i tempt the lord unhappy man he affects to show exceeding reverence to god and under a pretence of humility refuses to seek the grace offered by the divine goodness could he not see that when god wills to grant us a favour it is mere pride to reject it that god's gifts must needs be accepted and that true humility lies in obedience and the most literal compliance with his will well then god's will is that we should be perfect uniting ourselves to him and imitating him to the utmost of our powers the proud man who trusts in himself may well undertake nothing but the humble man is all the braver that he knows his own helplessness and his courage waxes in proportion to his low opinion of himself because all his trust is in god who delights to show forth his power in our weakness his mercy in our misery the safest course is humbly and piously to venture upon whatever may be considered profitable for us by those who undertake our spiritual guidance nothing can be more foolish than to fancy we know that of which we are really ignorant to affect knowledge while conscious that we are ignorant is intolerable vanity for my part i would rather not put forward that which i really do know while on the other hand neither would i affect ignorance when charity requires it you should readily and kindly impart to your neighbour not only that which is necessary for his instruction but also what is profitable for his consolation the same humility which conceals graces with a view to their preservation is ready to bring them forth at the bidding of charity with a view to their increase and perfection therein reminding me of that tree in the isles of tylus which closes its beautiful carnation blossoms at night only opening them to the rising sun so that the natives say they go to sleep just so humility hides our earthly virtues and perfections only expanding them at the call of charity which is not an earthly but a heavenly not a mere mortal but a divine virtue the true son of all virtues which should all be ruled by it so that any humility which controverts charity is unquestionably false i would not affect either folly or wisdom for just as humility deters me from pretending to be wise so simplicity and straightforwardness deter me from pretending to be foolish and just as vanity is opposed to humility so all affectation and pretence are opposed to honesty and simplicity if certain eminent servants of god have feigned folly in order to be despised by the world we may marvel but not imitate them 
for they had special and extraordinary reasons for doing extraordinary things and cannot be used as a rule for such as we are when david danced more than was customary before the ark of the covenant it was not with the intention of affecting folly but simply as expressing the unbounded and extraordinary gladness of his heart michal his wife reproached him with his actions as folly but he did not mind being vile and base in his own sight but declared himself willing to be despised for god's sake and so if you should be despised for acts of genuine devotion humility will enable you to rejoice in so blessed a contempt the cause of which does not lie with you End of part three chapter five part three chapter six of introduction to the devout life this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 3, Chapter 6. Humility Makes Us Rejoice in Our Own Abjection but my daughter i am going a step further and i bid you everywhere and in everything to rejoice in your own abjection perhaps you will ask in reply what i mean by that in latin abjection means humility and humility means abjection so that when our lady says in the magnificat that all generations shall call her blessed because god hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden she means that he has accepted her abjection and lowliness in order to fill her with graces and favors nevertheless there is a difference between humility and abjection for abjection is the poverty vileness and littleness which exists in us without our taking heed to them but humility implies a real knowledge and voluntary recognition of that abjection and the highest point of humility consists in not merely acknowledging one's objection but in taking pleasure therein not from any want of breadth or courage but to give the more glory to god's divine majesty and to esteem one's neighbor more highly than oneself this is what i would have you do and to explain myself more clearly let me tell you that the trials which afflict us are sometimes abject sometimes honorable now many people will accept the latter but very few are willing to accept the former everybody respects and pities a pious hermit shivering in his worn-out garb but let a poor gentleman or lady be in like case and they are despised for it and so their poverty is abject a religious receives a sharp rebuke from his superior meekly or a child from his parent and every one will call it obedience mortification wisdom but let a knight or a lady accept the like from some one albeit for the love of god and they will forthwith be accused of cowardice this again is abject suffering one person has a cancer in the arm another in the face the former only has the pain to bear but the latter has also to endure all the disgust and repulsion caused by his disease and this is objection and what i want to teach you is that we should not merely rejoice in our trouble which we do by means of patience but we should also cherish the objection which is done by means of humility again there are abject and honorable virtues for the world generally despises patience gentleness simplicity and even humility itself while on the contrary it highly esteems prudence valor and liberality sometimes even there may be a like distinction drawn between acts of one and the same virtue one being despised and the other respected thus almsgiving and forgiveness of injuries are both acts of charity but while every one esteems the first the world looks down upon the last a young man or a girl who refuses to join in the excesses of dress amusement or gossip of their circle 
is laughed at and criticized and their self-restraint is called affectation or bigotry well to rejoice in that is to rejoice in abjection or to take another shape of the same thing we are employed in visiting the sick if i am sent to the most wretched cases it is an abjection in the world's sight and consequently i like it if i am sent to those of a better class it is an interior abjection for there is less grace and merit in the work and so i can accept that abjection if one has a fall in the street there is the ridiculous part of it to be borne as well as the possible pain and this is an objection we must accept there are even some faults in which there is no harm beyond their objection and although humility does not require us to commit them intentionally it does require of us not to be disturbed at having committed them i mean certain foolish acts incivilities and inadvertencies which we ought to avoid as far as may be out of civility and decorum but of which if accidentally committed we ought to accept the abjection heartily out of humility to go further still if in anger or excitement i have been led to use unseemly words offending god and my neighbour thereby i will repent heartily and be very grieved for the offence which i must try to repair to the utmost but meanwhile i will accept the abjection and disgrace which will ensue and were it possible to separate the two things i ought earnestly to reject the sin while i retained the abjection readily but while we rejoice in the abjection we must nevertheless use all due and lawful means to remedy the evil whence it springs especially when the evil is serious thus if i have an abject disease in my face i should endeavour to get it cured although i do not wish to obliterate the abjection it has caused me if i have done something awkward which hurts no one i will not make excuses because although it was a failing my own objection is the only result but if i have given offence or scandal through my carelessness or folly i am bound to try and remedy it by a sincere apology there are occasions when charity requires us not to acquiesce in objection but in such a case one ought the more to take it inwardly to heart for one's private edification perhaps you will ask what are the most profitable forms of objection unquestionably those most helpful to our own souls and most acceptable to god are such as come accidentally or in the natural course of events because we have not chosen them ourselves but simply accepted god's choice which is always to be preferred to ours but if we are constrained to choose the greatest objections are best and the greatest is whatever is most contrary to one's individual inclination so long as it is in conformity with one's vocation for of a truth our self-will and self-pleasing mars many graces who can teach any of us truly to say with david i had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my god than to dwell in the tents of ungodliness none dear child save he who lived and died the scorn of men and the outcast of the people in order that we might be raised up i have said things here which must seem very hard to contemplate but believe me they will become sweet as honey when you try to put them in practice End of Part 3, Chapter 6。Part 3, Chapter 7 of Introduction to the Devout Life。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part three chapter seven how to combine due care for a good reputation with humility praise honour and glory are not bestowed on men for ordinary but for extraordinary virtue by praise we intend to lead men to appreciate the excellence of certain individuals 
giving them honour is the expression of our own esteem for them and i should say that glory is the combination of praise and honour from many persons if praise and honour are like precious stones glory is as an enamel thereof now as humility forbids us to aim at excelling or being preferred to others it likewise forbids us to aim at praise honour and glory but it allows us to give heed as the wise man says to our good name and that because a good name does not imply any one particular excellence but a general straightforward integrity of purpose which we may recognize in ourselves and desire to be known as possessing without any breach of humility humility might make us indifferent even to a good reputation were it not for charity's sake but seeing that it is a groundwork of society and without it we are not merely useless but positively harmful to the world because of such a scandal given by such a deficiency therefore charity requires and humility allows us to desire and to maintain a good reputation with care moreover just as the leaves of a tree are valuable not merely for beauty's sake but also as a shelter to the tender fruit so a good reputation if not in itself very important is still very useful not only as an embellishment of life but as a protection to our virtues especially to those which are weakly the necessity for acting up to our reputation and being what we are thought to be brings a strong though kindly motive power to bear upon a generous disposition let us foster all our virtues my daughter because they are pleasing to god the chief aim of all we do but just as when men preserve fruits they do not only conserve them but put them into suitable vessels so while divine love is the main thing which keeps us in the ways of holiness we may also find help from the effects of a good reputation but it will not do to be over-eager or fanciful about it those who are so very sensitive about their reputation are like people who are perpetually physicking themselves for every carnal ailment they mean to preserve their health but practically they destroy it and those who are so very fastidious over their good name are apt to lose it entirely for they become fanciful fretful and disagreeable provoking ill-natured remarks as a rule indifference to insult and slander is a much more effectual remedy than resentment wrath and vengeance slander melts away beneath contempt but indignation seems a sort of acknowledgment of its truth crocodiles never meddle with any but those who are afraid of them and slander only persists in attacking people who are disturbed by it an excessive fear of losing reputation indicates mistrust as to its foundations which are to be found in a good and true life those towns where the bridges are built of wood are very uneasy whenever a sign of flood appears but they who possess stone bridges are not anxious unless some very unusual storm appears and so a soul built up on solid christian foundations can afford to despise the outpour of slanderous tongues but those who know themselves to be weak are forever disturbed and uneasy be sure my daughter that he who seeks to be well thought of by everybody will be esteemed by nobody and those people deserve to be despised who are anxious to be highly esteemed by ungodly unworthy men reputation after all is but a signboard giving notice where virtue dwells and virtue itself is always and everywhere preferable therefore if it is said that you are a hypocrite because you are professedly devout or if you are called a coward because you have forgiven an insult despise all such accusations such judgments are the utterances of foolish men and you must not give up what is right even though your reputation suffer for fruit is better than foliage that is to say an inward and spiritual gain is worth all external gains we may take a jealous care of our reputation but not idolize it and while we desire not to displease good men neither should we seek to please those that are evil a man's natural adornment is his beard and a woman's her hair 
if either be torn out they may never grow again but if only shaven or shorn they will grow all the thicker and in like manner if our reputation be shorn or even shaven by slanderous tongues of which david says that with lies they cut like a sharp razor there is no need to be disturbed it will soon spring again if not brighter at all events more substantial but if it be lost through our own vices or meanness or evil living it will not be easily restored because its roots are plucked up and the root of a good name is to be found in virtue and honesty which will always cause it to spring up afresh however it may be assaulted if your good name suffers from some empty pursuit some useless habit some unworthy friendship they must be renounced for a good name is worth more than any such idle indulgence but if you are blamed or slandered for pious practices earnestness and devotion or whatever tends to win eternal life then let your slanderers have their way like dogs that bay at the moon be sure that if they should succeed in rousing any evil impression against you clipping the beard of your reputation as it were your good name will soon revive and the razor of slander will strengthen your honour just as the pruning knife strengthens the vine and causes it to bring forth more abundant fruit let us keep jesus christ crucified always before our eyes let us go on trustfully and simply but with discretion and wisdom in his service and he will take care of our reputation if he permits us to lose it it will only be to give us better things and to train us in a holy humility one ounce of which is worth more than a thousand pounds of honour if we are unjustly blamed let us quietly meet calumny with truth if calumny perseveres let us persevere in humility there is no surer shelter for our reputation or our soul than the hand of god let us serve him in good report or evil report alike with st paul so that we may cry out with david for thy sake have i suffered reproof shame hath covered my face of course certain crimes so grievous that no one who can justify himself should remain silent must be accepted as too certain persons whose reputation closely affects the edification of others in this case all theologians say that it is right quietly to seek reparation end of part three chapter seven part three chapter eight of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part three chapter eight gentleness towards others and remedies against anger the holy chrism used by the church according to apostolic tradition is made of olive oil mingled with balm which among other things are emblematic of two virtues very specially conspicuous in our dear lord himself and which he has specially commended to us as though they above all things drew us to him and taught us to imitate him take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart humility makes our lives acceptable to god meekness makes us acceptable to men balm as i said before sinking to the bottom of all liquids is a figure of humility and oil floating as it does to the top is a figure of gentleness and cheerfulness rising above all things and excelling all things the very flower of love which so says st bernard comes to perfection when it is not merely patient but gentle and cheerful give heed then daughter that you keep this mystic chrism of gentleness and humility in your heart for it is a favourite device of the enemy 
to make people content with a fair outside semblance of these graces not examining their inner hearts and so fancying themselves to be gentle and humble while they are far otherwise and this is easily perceived because in spite of their ostentatious gentleness and humility they are stirred up with pride and anger by the smallest wrong or contradiction there is a popular belief that those who take the antidote commonly called st paul's gift do not suffer from the viper's bite provided that is that the remedy be pure and even so true gentleness and humility will avert the burning and swelling which contradiction is apt to excite in our hearts if when stung by slander or ill-nature we wax proud and swell with anger it is a proof that our gentleness and humility are unreal and mere artificial show when the patriarch joseph sent his brethren back from egypt to his father's house he only gave them one counsel see that ye fall not out by the way and so my child say i to you this miserable life is but the road to a blessed life do not let us fall out by the way one with another let us go on with the company of our brethren gently peacefully and kindly most emphatically i say it if possible fall out with no one and on no pretext whatever suffer your heart to admit anger and passion st james says plainly and unreservedly that the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of god of course it is a duty to resist evil and to repress the faults of those for whom we are responsible steadily and firmly but gently and quietly nothing so stills the elephant when enraged as the sight of a lamb nor does anything break the force of a cannon-ball so well as wool correction given in anger however tempered by reason never has so much effect as that which is given altogether without anger for the reasonable soul being naturally subject to reason it is a mere tyranny which subjects it to passion and wherein soever reason is led by passion it becomes odious and its just rule obnoxious when a monarch visits a country peaceably the people are gratified and flattered but if the king has to take his armies through the land even on behalf of the public welfare his visit is sure to be unwelcome and harmful because however strictly military discipline may be enforced there will always be some mischief done to the people just so when reason prevails and administers reproof correction and punishment in a calm spirit although it be strict every one approves and is content but if reason be hindered by anger and vexation which st augustine calls her soldiers there will be more fear than love and reason itself will be despised and resisted the same st augustine writing to profiturus says that it is better to refuse entrance to any even the least semblance of anger however just and that because once entered in it is hard to be got rid of and what was but a little moat soon waxes into a great beam for if anger tarries till night and the sun goes down upon our wrath a thing expressly forbidden by the apostle there is no longer any way of getting rid of it it feeds upon endless false fancies for no angry man ever yet but thought his anger just depend upon it it is better to learn how to live without being angry than to imagine one can moderate and control anger lawfully and if through weakness and frailty one is overtaken by it it is far better to put it away forcibly than to parley with it for give anger ever so little way and it will become master like the serpent who easily works in its body wherever it can once introduce its head you will ask how to put away anger my child when you feel its first movements collect yourself gently and seriously not hastily or with impetuosity sometimes in a law court the officials who enforce quiet make more noise than those they affect to hush and so if you are impetuous in restraining your temper you will throw your heart into worse confusion than before and 
amid the excitement it will lose all self-control having thus gently exerted yourself follow the advice which the aged st augustine gave to a younger bishop auxilius do said he what a man should do if you are like the psalmist ready to cry out mine eye is consumed for very anger go on to say have mercy upon me o lord so that god may stretch forth his right hand and control your wrath i mean that when we feel stirred with anger we ought to call upon god for help like the apostles when they were tossed about with wind and storm and he is sure to say peace be still but even here i would again warn you that your very prayers against the angry feelings which urge you should be gentle calm and without vehemence remember this rule in whatever remedies against anger you may seek further directly you are conscious of an angry act atone for the fault by some speedy act of meekness towards the person who excited your anger it is a sovereign cure for untruthfulness to unsay what you have falsely said at once undetecting yourself in falsehood and so too it is a good remedy for anger to make immediate amends by some opposite act of meekness there is an old saying that fresh wounds are soonest closed moreover when there is nothing to stir your wrath lay up a store of meekness and kindliness speaking and acting in things great and small as gently as possible remember that the bride of the canticles is described as not merely dropping honey and milk also from her lips but as having it under her tongue that is to say in her heart so we must not only speak gently to our neighbour but we must be filled heart and soul with gentleness and we must not merely seek the sweetness of aromatic honey in courtesy and suavity with strangers but also the sweetness of milk among those of our own household and our neighbours a sweetness terribly lacking to some who are as angels abroad and devils at home End of part three chapter eight part three chapter nine of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part three chapter nine on gentleness towards ourselves one important direction in which to exercise gentleness is with respect to ourselves never growing irritated with one's self or one's imperfections for although it is but reasonable that we should be displeased and grieved at our own faults yet ought we to guard against a bitter angry or peevish feeling about them many people fall into the error of being angry because they have been angry vexed because they have given way to vexation thus keeping up a chronic state of irritation which adds to the evil of what is past and prepares the way for a fresh fall on the first occasion moreover all this anger and irritation against one's self fosters pride and springs entirely from self-love which is disturbed and fretted by its own imperfection what we want is a quiet steady firm displeasure at our own faults a judge gives sentence more effectually speaking deliberately and calmly than if he be impetuous and passionate for in the latter case he punishes not so much the actual faults before him but what they appear to him to be and so we can chasten ourselves far better by a quiet steadfast repentance than by eager hasty ways of penitence which in fact are proportioned not by the weight of our faults but according to our feelings and inclinations thus one man who specially aims at purity will be intensely vexed with himself at some very trifling fault against it while he looks upon some gross slander of which he has been guilty as a mere laughing matter 
on the other hand another will torment himself painfully over some slight exaggeration while he altogether overlooks some serious offence against purity and so on with other things all this arises solely because men do not judge themselves by the light of reason but under the influence of passion believe me my daughter as a parent's tender affectionate remonstrance has far more weight with his child than anger and sternness so when we judge our own heart guilty if we treat it gently rather in a spirit of pity than anger encouraging it to amendment its repentance will be much deeper and more lasting than if we stirred up in vehemence and wrath for instance let me suppose that i am specially seeking to conquer vanity and yet that i have fallen conspicuously into that sin instead of taking myself to task as abominable and wretched for breaking so many resolutions calling myself unfit to lift up my eyes to heaven as disloyal faithless and the like i would deal pitifully and quietly with myself poor heart so soon fallen again into the snare well now rise up again bravely and fall no more seek god's mercy hope in him ask him to keep you from falling again and begin to tread the pathway of humility afresh we must be more on guard henceforth such a course will be the surest way to making a steadfast substantial resolution against the special fault to which should be added any external means suitable and the advice of one's director if any one does not find this gentle dealing sufficient let him use sterner self-rebuke and admonition provided only that whatever indignation he may rouse against himself he finally works it all up to a tender loving trust in god treading in the footsteps of that great penitent who cried out to his troubled soul why art thou so vexed o my soul and why art thou so disquieted within me o put thy trust in god for i will yet thank him which is the help of my countenance and my god so then when you have fallen lift up your heart in quietness humbling yourself deeply before god by reason of your frailty without marvelling that you fell there is no cause to marvel because weakness is weak or infirmity infirm heartily lament that you should have offended god and begin anew to cultivate the lacking grace with a very deep trust in his mercy and with a bold brave heart End of Part 3, Chapter 9part three chapter ten of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by phil chenevere introduction to the devout life by saint francis de sales part three chapter ten we must attend to the business of life carefully but without eagerness or over anxiety the care and diligence due to our ordinary businesses are very different from solicitude anxiety and restlessness the angels care for our salvation and seek it diligently but they are wholly free from anxiety and solicitude for whereas care and diligence naturally appertain to their love anxiety would be wholly inconsistent with their happiness for although care and diligence go hand in hand with calmness and peace those angelic properties could not unite with solicitude or anxiety much less with over eagerness therefore my daughter be careful and diligent in all your affairs god who commits them to you wills you to give them your best attention but strive not to be anxious and solicitous that is to say do not set about your work with restlessness and excitement and do not give way to bustle and eagerness in what you do every form of excitement affects both judgment and reason and hinders a right performance of the very thing which excites us our lord rebuking martha said 
Thou art careful and troubled about many things. If she had been simply careful, she would not have been troubled, but giving way to disquiet and anxiety, she grew eager and troubled, and for that our Lord reproved her. The rivers, which flow gently through our plains, bear barges of rich merchandise, and the gracious rains, which fall softly on the land, fertilize it to bear the fruits of the earth. But when the rivers swell into torrents, they hinder commerce and devastate the country, and violent storms and tempests do the like. No work done with impetuosity and excitement was ever done well and the old proverb, make haste slowly, is a good one. Solomon says, There is one that laboreth, and taketh pains, and maketh haste, and is so much the more behind. We are always soon enough when we do well. The bumblebee makes far more noise, and is more bustling than the honey-bee, but it makes naught save wax, no honey. Just so those who are restless and eager or full of noisy solicitude never do much or well flies harass us less by what they do than by reason of their multitude and so great matters give us less disturbance than a multitude of small affairs accept the duties which come upon you quietly and try to fulfil them methodically one after another if you attempt to do everything at once or with confusion, you will only cumber yourself with your own exertions, and by dint of perplexing your mind, you will probably be overwhelmed and accomplish nothing. In all your affairs, lean solely on God's providence, by means of which alone your plans can succeed. Meanwhile, on your part, work on in quiet cooperation with him, and then rest satisfied that if you have trusted entirely to him, you will always obtain such a measure of success as is most profitable for you, whether it seems so or not to your own individual judgment. Imitate a little child whom one sees holding tight with one hand to its father, while with the other it gathers strawberries or blackberries from the wayside hedge. Even so, while you gather and use this world's goods with one hand, always let the other be fast in your heavenly Father's hand, and look round from time to time to make sure that he is satisfied with what you are doing, at home or abroad. Beware of letting go under the idea of making or receiving more. If he forsakes you, you will fall to the ground at the first step. When your ordinary work or business is not specially engrossing, let your heart be fixed more on God than on it. And if the work be such as to require your undivided attention, then pause from time to time and look to God, even as navigators who make for the haven they would attain, by looking up at the heavens, rather than down upon the deeps on which they sail. So doing, God will work with you, in you, and for you, and your work will be blessed. End of Part 3, Chapter 10all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales, Part 3, Chapter 11, On Obedience. Love alone leads to perfection. But the three chief means of acquiring it are obedience, chastity, and poverty. Obedience is a consecration of the heart. Chastity of the body and poverty of all worldly goods to the love and service of God. These are the three members of the spiritual cross, 
and all three must be raised upon the fourth, which is humility. I am not going here to speak of these three virtues as solemn vows, which only concerns religious, nor even as ordinary vows, although when sought under the shelter of a vow all virtues receive an enhanced grace and merit. But it is not necessary for perfection that they should be undertaken as vows, so long as they are practiced diligently. The three vows solemnly taken put a man into the state of perfection, whereas a diligent observation thereof brings him to perfection. For, observe, there is a great difference between the state of perfection and perfection itself, insomuch as all prelates and religious are in the former, although unfortunately it is too obvious that by no means all attain to the latter. Let us then endeavor to practice these three virtues according to our several vocations, for although we are not thereby called to a state of perfection, we may attain through them to perfection itself, and of a truth we are bound to practice them, although not all, after the same manner. There are two kinds of obedience, one necessary, the other voluntary. The first includes a humble obedience to your ecclesiastical superiors, whether pope, bishop, curate, or those commissioned by them. You are likewise bound to obey your civil superiors, king and magistrates, as also your domestic superiors, father, mother, master, or mistress. Such obedience is called necessary, because no one can free himself from the duty of obeying the superiors, God having appointed them severally to bear rule over us. Therefore do you obey their commands as of right. But if you would be perfect, follow their counsels and even their wishes as far as charity and prudence will allow. Obey as to things acceptable, as when they bid you eat or take recreation, for although there may be no great virtue in obedience in such case, there is great harm in disobedience. Obey in things indifferent as concerning questions of dress, coming and going, singing or keeping silence, for herein is a very laudable obedience. Obey in things hard, disagreeable, and inconvenient, and therein lies a very perfect obedience. Moreover, obey quietly without answering again, promptly without delay, cheerfully without reluctance, and above all, render a loving obedience for his sake who became obedient even to the death of the cross for our sake, who, as St. Bernard says, chose rather to resign his life than his obedience. If you would acquire a ready obedience to superiors, accustom yourself to yield to your equals, giving way to their opinions where nothing wrong is involved, without arguing or peevishness, and adapt yourself easily to the wishes of your inferiors as far as you reasonably can, and forbear the exercise of stern authority so long as they do well. It is a mistake for those who find it hard to pay a willing obedience to their natural superiors to suppose that if they were professed religious they would find it easy to obey. Voluntary obedience is such as we undertake by our own choice and which is not imposed by others. Persons do not choose their own king or bishop or parents, often not even their husband, but most people choose their confessor or director, and whether a person takes a vow of obedience to him, as St. Teresa, beyond her formal vow to the superior of her order, bound herself by a simple vow to obey Father Gratian, or whether, without any vow, they resolve to obey their chosen spiritual guide, all such obedience is voluntary, because it depends upon our own will. Obedience to lawful superiors is regulated by their official claims. Thus, in all public and legal matters, we are bound to obey our king. In ecclesiastical matters, our bishop, 
in domestic matters our father master or husband and in personal matters which concern the soul our confessor or spiritual guide seek to be directed in your religious exercises by your spiritual father because thereby they will have double grace and virtue that which is inherent in that they are devout and that which comes by reason of the spirit of obedience in which they are performed blessed indeed are the obedient for god will never permit them to go astray end of section 3 chapter 11「Introduction to the Devout Life」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are available in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Salve Recording by Kenita Hill, Williamsburg Chapter 12 On Purity Purity is the lily among virtues. By it men approach to the angels. There is no beauty without purity, and human purity is chastity. We speak of the chaste as honest, and of the loss of purity as dishonor. Purity is an intact thing. Its converse is corruption. In a word, its special glory is in the spotless whiteness of soul and body. No unlawful pleasures are compatible with chastity. The pure heart is like the mother of pearl, which admits no drop of water, save that which comes from heaven. It is closed to every attraction, save such as are sanctified by holy matrimony. Close your heart to every questionable tenderness or delight. Guard against all that is unprofitable, though it may be lawful and strive to avoid unduly fixing your heart even on that which in itself is right and good every one has great need of this virtue those living in widowhood need a brave chastity not only to forego present and future delights but to resist the memories of the past with which a happy married life naturally fills the imagination softening and weakening the will St. Augustine louds the purity of his beloved Alipius, who had altogether forgotten and despised the carnal pleasures in which his youth was passed. While fruits are whole, you may store them up securely, some in straw, some in sand, or amid their own foliage. But once bruised, there is no means of preserving them, save with sugar or honey. Even so, the purity which has never been tampered with may well be preserved to the end, but when once that has ceased to exist, nothing can ensure its existence but the genuine devotion, which, as I have often said, is the very honey and sugar of the mind. The unmarried need a very simple, sensitive purity, which will drive away all over-curious thoughts, and teach them to despise all merely sensual satisfactions. The young are apt to imagine that of which they are ignorant to be wondrous sweet and as the foolish moth hovers around a light, and persisting in coming too near, perishes in its own inquisitive folly, so they perish through their unwise approach to forbidden pleasures. And married people need a watchful purity whereby to keep God ever before them, and to seek all earthly happiness and delight through Him alone, ever remembering that He has sanctified the state of holy matrimony by making it the type of His own union with the Church. The Apostle says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 87. By which holiness he means purity. Of a truth, my daughter, without purity no one can ever see God. 88. Nor can any hope to dwell in his tabernacle, except he lead an uncorrupt life. 89. And our blessed Lord himself has promised the special blessing of beholding him, to those who are pure in heart. End of Part 3, Chapter 12 Part 3, Chapter 13 of Introduction to the Devout Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are available in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenita Hill, Williamsburg. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 3, Chapter 13 How to Maintain Purity. Chapter 13 How to Maintain Purity. Be exceedingly quick in turning aside from the slightest thing leading to impurity, for it is an evil which approaches stealthily, and in which the very smallest beginnings are apt to grow rapidly. It is always easier to fly from such evils than to cure them. Human bodies are like glasses, which cannot come into collision without risk of breaking, or to fruits, which, however fresh and ripe, are damaged by pressure. Never permit any one to take any manner of foolish liberty with you, since, although there may be no evil intention, the perfectness of purity is injured thereby. Purity has its source in the heart, but it is in the body that its material results take shape, and therefore may be forfeited both by the exterior senses and by the thoughts and desires of the heart. All lack of modesty in seeing, hearing, speaking, smelling or touching is impurity, especially when the heart takes pleasure therein. As Paul says, without any hesitation that impurity and uncleanness or foolish unseemly talking are not to be so much as named among Christians. The bee not only shuns all carrion, but abhors and flies far from the faintest smell proceeding therefrom. The bride of canticles is represented with hands dropping with myrrh, a preservative against all corruption. Her lips are like a thread of scarlet, the type of modest words. Her eyes are dove's eyes, clear and soft. Her nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh towards Damascus, an incorruptible wood. Her ears are hung with earrings of pure gold, and even so the devout soul should be pure, honest, and transparent in hand, lip, eye, ear, and the whole body. Remember that there are things which blemish perfect purity, without being in themselves downright acts of impurity. Anything which tends to lessen its intense sensitiveness, or to cast the slightest shadow over it, is of this nature, and all evil thoughts or foolish acts of levity or heedlessness are as steps towards the most direct breaches of the law of chastity. Avoid the society of persons who are wanting in purity, especially if they are bold, as indeed impure people always are. If a foul animal licks the sweet almond tree, its fruit becomes bitter, and so a corrupt, pestilential man can scarcely hold communication with others, whether men or women, without damaging their perfect purity. Their very glance is venomous, and their breath blighting like the basilic. On the other hand, seek out good and pure men, read and ponder holy things, for the word of God is pure, and it will make those pure who study it. Wherefore David likens it to gold and precious stones. Always abide close to Jesus Christ crucified, both spiritually in meditation and actually in holy communion. For as all those who sleep upon the plant called Agnes Castus become pure and chaste, so, if you rest your heart upon our dear Lord, the very Lamb, pure and immaculate, you will find that soon both heart and soul will be purified of all spot or stain. End of chapter 13。Part 3, Chapter 14 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 3, Chapter 14. On Poverty of Spirit Amid Riches Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And if so, woe be to the rich in spirit, for theirs must be the bitterness of hell. By rich in spirit I mean him whose riches engross his mind, or whose mind is buried in his riches. He is poor in spirit, whose heart is not filled with the love of riches, whose mind is not set upon them. 
the halcyon builds its nest like a ball and leaving but one little aperture in the upper part launches it on the sea so secure and impenetrable that the waves carry it along without any water getting in and it floats on the sea superior so to say to the waves and this my child is what your heart should be open only to heaven impenetrable to riches and earthly treasures if you have them keep your heart from attaching itself to them let it maintain a higher level and amidst riches be as though you had none superior to them do not let that mind which is the likeness of god cleave to mere earthly goods let it always be raised above them not sunk in them there is a wide difference between having poison and being poisoned all apothecaries have poison ready for special uses but they are not consequently poisoned because the poison is only in their shop not in themselves and so you may possess riches without being poisoned by them so long as they are in your house or purse only and not in your heart it is the christian's privilege to be rich in material things and poor in attachment to them thereby having the use of riches in this world and the merit of poverty in the next of a truth my daughter no one will ever own themselves to be avaricious every one denies this contemptible vice men excuse themselves on the plea of providing for their children or plead the duty of prudent forethought they never have too much there is always some good reason for accumulating more and even the most avaricious of men not only do not own to being such but sincerely believe that they are not and that because avarice is as strong a fever which is all the less felt as it rages most fiercely moses saw that sacred fire which burned the bush without consuming it but the profane fire of avarice acts precisely the other way it consumes the miser but without burning for amid its most intense heat he believes himself to be deliciously cool and imagines his insatiable thirst to be merely natural and right if you long earnestly anxiously and persistently after what you do not possess it is all very well to say that you do not wish to get it unfairly but you are all the time guilty of avarice he who longs eagerly and anxiously to drink though it may be water only thereby indicates that he is feverish i hardly think we can say that it is lawful to wish lawfully to possess that which is another's so doing we surely wish our own gain at the expense of that other and he who possesses anything lawfully surely has more right to possess it than we to obtain it why should we desire that which is his even were the wish lawful it is not charitable for we should not like other men to desire what we possess however lawfully this was ahab's sin when he sought to acquire naboth's vineyard by lawful purchase when naboth lawfully desired to keep it himself he coveted it eagerly continually and anxiously and so doing he displeased god do not allow yourself to wish for that which is your neighbour's until he wishes to part with it then his wish will altogether justify yours and i am quite willing that you should add to your means and possessions provided it be not merely with strict justice but kindly and charitably done if you cleave closely to your possessions and are cumbered with them setting your heart and thoughts upon them and restlessly anxious lest you should suffer loss then believe me you are still somewhat feverish for fever patients drink the water we give them with an eagerness and satisfaction not common to those who are well it is not possible to take great pleasure in anything without becoming attached to it if you lose property and find yourself grievously afflicted at the loss you may be sure that you were warmly attached to it there is no surer proof of affection for the thing lost than our sorrow at its loss therefore do not fix your longings on anything which you do not possess do not let your heart rest in that which you have do not grieve over much at the losses which may happen to you and then you may reasonably believe that although rich in fact you are not so in affection but that you are poor in spirit and therefore blessed for the kingdom of heaven is yours end of part three chapter fourteen
Part three, chapter fifteen, of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Twinkle. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part three, chapter fifteen. How to exercise real poverty although actually rich. The painter Parasius drew an ingenious and imaginative representation of the Athenians, ascribing sundry opposite qualities to them, calling them at once capricious, irascible, unjust, inconstant, courteous, merciful, compassionate, haughty, vainglorious, humble, boastful, and cowardly. And for my part, dear daughter, I would fain see united in your heart both riches and poverty, a great care and a great contempt for temporal things. Do you take much greater pains than is the want of worldly men to make your riches useful and fruitful? Are not the gardeners of a prince more diligent in cultivating and beautifying the royal gardens than if they were their own? Wherefore? surely because these gardens are the king's, to whom his gardeners would fain render an acceptable service. My child, our possessions are not ours. God has given them to us to cultivate, that we may make them fruitful and profitable in his service, and so doing we shall please him. And this we must do more earnestly than worldly men, for they look carefully after their property out of self-love, and we must work for the love of God. Now self-love is a restless, anxious, over-eager love, and so the work done on its behalf is troubled, vexatious, and unsatisfactory, whereas the love of God is calm, peaceful, and tranquil, and so the work done for its sake, even in worldly things, is gentle, trustful, and quiet. Let us take such a quiet care to preserve, and even when practicable to increase, our temporal goods, according to the duties of our possession. This is acceptable to God for his love's sake. But beware that you do not be deceived by self-love, for sometimes it counterfeits the love of God so cleverly that you may mistake one for the other. To avoid this, and to prevent a due care for your temporal interests from degenerating into avarice, it is needful often to practice a real poverty amid the riches with which God has endowed you. To this end, always dispose of a part of your means by giving them heartily to the poor. You impoverish yourself by whatever you give away. It is true that God will restore it to you, not only in the next world, but in this, for nothing brings so much temporal prosperity as free almsgiving, but meanwhile you are sensibly poorer for what you give. Truly that is a holy and rich poverty which results from almsgiving. Love the poor and poverty. This will make you truly poor, since, as Holy Scripture says, we become like to that we love. Love makes lovers equal. Who is weak, and I am not weak, says St. Paul. He might have said, Who is poor, and I am not poor. For it was love which made him like to those he loved. And so, if you love the poor, you will indeed share their poverty, and be poor like them. And if you love the poor, seek them out. Take pleasure in bringing them to your home. And in going to theirs, talk freely with them and be ready to meet them, whether in church or elsewhere. Let your tongue be poor with them in converse, but let your hands be rich to distribute out of your abundance. Are you prepared to go yet further, my child? Not to stop at being poor like the poor, or even poorer still? The servant is not so great as his Lord. Do you be the servant of the poor? Tend their sickbed with your own hands. Be their cook, their needlewoman. O oh, my daughter, such servitude is more glorious than royalty. How touchingly St. Louis, one of the greatest of kings, 
fulfilled this duty, serving the poor in their own houses, and daily causing three to eat at his own table, often himself eating the remains of their food and his loving humility. In his frequent visits to the hospitals, he would select those afflicted with the most loathsome diseases, ulcers, cancer, and the like, and these he would tend, kneeling down and bareheaded, beholding the Savior of the world in them, and cherishing them with all the tenderness of a mother's love. St. Elizabeth of Hungary used to mix freely with the poor, and liked to dress in their homely garments amid their gay ladies. Surely these royal personages were poor amid their riches, and rich in poverty. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the day of judgment, the king of prince and peasant will say to them, I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was naked, and ye clothed me. Come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Everybody finds themselves sometimes deficient in what they need, and put to inconvenience. A guest whom we would fain receive honorably arrives, and we cannot entertain him as we would. We want our costly apparel in one place, and it all happens to be somewhere else. All the wine in our cellar suddenly turns sour. We find ourselves accidentally in some country place where everything is wanting. Room, bed, food, attendance. In short, the richest people may easily be without something they want, and that is practically to suffer poverty. Accept such occurrences cheerfully, rejoice in them, bear them willingly. Again, if you are impoverished much or little by unforeseen events, such as storm, flood, fire, drought, theft, or lawsuit, then is the time to practice poverty, accepting the loss quietly and adapting yourself patiently to your altered circumstances. Esau and Jacob both came to their father with hairy hands, but the hair on Jacob's hands did not grow from his skin and could be torn off without pain, while that on Esau's hands, being the natural growth of his skin, he would have cried out and resisted if any one had torn it off. So if our possessions are very close to our heart, and storm or thief tear them away, we shall break forth in impatient murmurs and lamentations. But if we only cleave to them with that solicitude which God wills us to have, and not with our whole heart, we shall see them rent away without losing our sense of calmness. This is just the difference between the clothing of men and beasts. Beast's clothing grows on its flesh, and man's is only laid on, so that it may be laid aside at will. End of Part 3, Chapter 15「three, Chapter Sixteen of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Twinkle. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part three, Chapter Sixteen. How to Possess a Rich Spirit Amid Real Poverty But if you are really poor, my daughter, for God's sake, be so in spirit. Make a virtue of necessity, and turn that precious stone poverty to its true value. The brilliancy thereof is not perceived in this world, but nevertheless it is very great. Patience, then, you are in good company. Our dear Lord, our lady the apostles numberless saints both men and women were poor and although they might have been rich disdained to be so how many great ones of this world have gone through many difficulties to seek holy poverty amid hospitals and cloisters what pains they took to find it let saint alexis saint paula saint paulinus saint angela and many another witness, whereas to you, my child, 
it has come unasked you have met poverty without seeking it do you then embrace it as the beloved friend of jesus christ who was born lived and died in poverty and cherished it all his life there are two great privileges connected with your poverty through which you may acquire great merit first it is not your own choice but god's will alone which has made you poor now whatever we accept simply because it is god's will is acceptable in his sight so long as we accept it heartily and out of love the less of self the more of god and a single-hearted acceptance of god's will purifies any suffering very greatly the second privilege is that this poverty is so very poor there is a bepraised caressed poverty so petted and cared for that it can hardly be called poor like the despised contemned neglected poverty which also exists now most secular poverty is of this last kind for those who are involuntarily poor and cannot help themselves are not much thought of and for that very reason their poverty is poorer than that of religious although religious poverty has a very special and excellent grace through the intention and the vow by which it is accepted do not complain then of your poverty my daughter we only complain of that which is unwelcome and if poverty is unwelcome to you you are no longer poor in spirit do not fret under such assistance as is needful therein lies one great grace of poverty it were over ambitious to aim at being poor without suffering any inconvenience in other words to have the credit of poverty and the convenience of riches do not be ashamed of being poor or of asking alms receive what is given you with humility and accept a refusal meekly frequently called to mind our lady's journey into egypt with her holy child and of all the poverty contempt and suffering they endured if you follow their example you will indeed be rich amid your poverty end of part three chapter sixteen part three chapter seventeen of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by twinkle introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part three chapter seventeen on friendship evil and frivolous friendship foremost among the soul's affections is love love is the ruler of every motion of the heart drawing all to itself and making us like to that we love beware then my daughter of harboring any evil affection or you too will become evil and friendship is the most dangerous of all affections because any other love may exist without much mental communication but as friendship is founded thereon it is hardly possible to be closely bound by its ties to any one without sharing in his qualities all love is not friendship for one may love without any return and friendship implies mutual love further those who are bound by such affection must be conscious that it is reciprocal otherwise there may be love but not friendship and moreover there must be something communicated between the friends as a solid foundation of friendship friendship varies according to these communications and they vary according to that which people have to communicate if men share false and vain things their friendship will be false and vain if that which is good and true their friendship will be good and true and the better that which is the staple of the bond so much the better will the friendship be that honey is best which is culled from the choicest flowers 
and so friendship built upon the highest and purest intercommunion is the best and just as a certain kind of honey brought from pontus is poisonous being made from aconite so that those who eat it lose their senses so the friendship which is based on unreal or evil grounds will itself be hollow and worthless mere sensual intercourse is not worthy of the name of friendship and were there nothing more in married love it would not deserve to bear the name but inasmuch as that involves the participation of life industry possessions affections and an unalterable fidelity marriage when rightly understood is a very real and holy friendship whatever is founded on mere sensuality vanity or frivolity is unworthy to be called friendship i mean such attractions as are purely external a sweet voice personal beauty and the cleverness or outward show which have some great weight with some you will often hear women and young people unhesitatingly decide that such an one is very delightful very admirable because he is good-looking well dressed sings or dances or talks well even charlatans esteem the wittiest clown amongst them as their best man but all these things are purely sensual and the connections built on such foundation must be vain and frivolous more fitly to be called trifling than friendship they spring up chiefly among young people who are easily fascinated by personal attractions dress and gossip friendships in which the tailor and hairdresser have the chief part how can such friendships be other than short-lived melting away like snow wreaths in the sun End of Part 3, Chapter 17part three chapter eighteen of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by twinkle introduction to the devout life by st francis de sales part three chapter eighteen on frivolous attachments such foolish attachments between man and woman without any matrimonial intentions as are called amorettes mere abortions or rather phantoms of friendship must not idle and empty as they are profane the name of friendship or love yet such frivolous contemptible attractions often snare the hearts of both men and women and although they may end in downright sin there is no such intention on the part of their victims who consciously do but yield to foolish trifling and toying some such have no object beyond the actual indulgence of a passing inclination others are excited by vanity which takes pleasure in captivating hearts some are stimulated by a combination of both these motives but all such friendships are evil hollow and vain evil in that they often lead to sinful deeds and draw the heart from god and from the husband or wife who is its lawful owner hollow in that they are baseless and without root vain in that neither gain honour nor satisfaction can come from such on the contrary nothing comes of them but a loss of time and credit and unreasoning excitement mistrust jealousy and perturbation st gregory nazianzen speaks very wisely on this subject admonishing vain women and his words are equally applicable to men your natural beauty will suffice your husband but if it is exhibited to all like a net spread before birds what will be the end you will be taken by whoever admires you looks and glances will be exchanged smiles and tender words at first hesitatingly exchanged but soon more boldly given and received far be it from me to describe the end 
but this much i will say nothing said or done by young men and women under such circumstances but is perilous one act of levity leads to another as the links in a chain they who tamper with such things will fall into the trap they fancy that they only mean to amuse themselves but will not go too far little you know forsooth the tiny spark will burst into a flame and overpowering your heart it will reduce your good resolutions to ashes and your reputation to smoke who will pity a charmer that is bitten with the serpent asks the wise man and with him i ask do you in your folly imagine that you can lightly handle love as you please you think to trifle with it but it will sting you cruelly and then every one will mock you and laugh at your foolish pretension to harbor a venomous serpent in your bosom which has poisoned and lost alike your honor and your soul what fatal blindness this to stake all that is most precious to man yes i say it advisedly for god desires to have us only for the sake of our soul or the soul through our will and our will for love's sake surely we have not by any means a sufficient store of love to offer god and yet in our madness and folly we lavish and waste it on vain frivolous objects as though we had enough and to spare our dear lord who demands not to save our love in return for our creation preservation and redemption will require a strict account of the senseless way in which we have frittered and wasted it if he will call us to account for idle words how will it be with respect to idle foolish pernicious friendships husbandmen know that the walnut tree is very harmful in a vineyard or field because it absorbs the fatness of the land and draws it away from the other crops its thick foliage overshadows and deprives them of sunshine and moreover it attracts passers-by who tread down and spoil all that is around while striving to gather its fruit so with these foolish love affairs and the soul they engross it so that it is unable to bring forth good works their superfluous foliage flirtations dallyings and idle talk consume profitable time and moreover they lead to so many temptations distractions suspicions and the like that the heart becomes altogether crushed and spoiled such follies not only banish heavenly love they likewise drive out the fear of god enervate the mind and damage reputation they may be the plaything of courts but assuredly they are as a plague spot of the heart end of part three chapter eighteen Part three, chapter nineteen of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part three, chapter nineteen of Real Friendship. Do you, my child, love every one with a pure love of charity? but have no friendship save with those whose intercourse is true and good, and the purer the bond which unites you, so much higher will your friendship be. If your intercourse is based on science, it is praiseworthy, still more if it arises from a participation in goodness, prudence, justice, and the like. But if the bond of your mutual liking be charity, devotion, and Christian perfection, God knows how very precious a friendship it is precious because it comes from god because it tends to god because god is the link that binds you because it will last for ever in him truly it is a blessed thing to love on earth as we hope to love in heaven and to begin that friendship here which is to endure for ever there i am not now speaking of simple charity a love due to all mankind but of that spiritual friendship which binds souls together leading them to share devotions and spiritual interests so as to have but one mind between them such as these may well cry out 
behold how good and joyful a thing it is brethren to dwell together in unity even so for the precious ointment of devotion trickles continually from one heart to the other so that truly we may say that to such friendship the lord promises his blessing and life for evermore to my mind all other friendship is but as a shadow with respect to this its links mere fragile glass compared to the golden bond of true devotion do you form no other friendships i say form because you have no right to cast aside or neglect the natural bonds which draw you to relations connections benefactors or neighbors my rules apply to those you deliberately choose to make there are some who will tell you that you should avoid all special affection or friendship as likely to engross the heart distract the mind excite jealousy and what not but they are confusing things they have read in the works of saintly and devout writers that individual friendships and special intimacies are a great hindrance in the religious life and therefore they suppose it to be the same with all the world which is not at all the case whereas in a well-regulated community every one's aim is true devotion there is no need for individual intercourse which might exceed due limits in the world those who aim at a devout life require to be united one with another by a holy friendship which excites stimulates and encourages them in well-doing just as men traversing a plain have no need to hold one another up as they have who are amid slippery mountain paths so religious do not need the stay of individual friendships but those who are living in the world require such for strength and comfort amid the difficulties which beset them in the world all have not one aim one mind and therefore we must take to us congenial friends nor is there any undue partiality in such attachments which are but as a separation of good from evil the sheep from the goats the bee from the drone a necessary separation no one can deny that our dear lord loved st john lazarus martha magdalene with a specially tender friendship since we are told so in holy scripture and we know that st paul dearly loved st mark st petronilla as st paul timothy and thesia st gregory nesiensen boasts continually of his friendships with the great st basil of which he says it seemed as though with two bodies we had but one soul and if we may not believe those who say that all things are in all else at least one must affirm that we were two in one and one in two the only object that both had being to grow in holiness and to mould our present life to our future hopes thereby forsaking this mortal world before our death and saint augustine says that saint ambrose loved saint monica by reason of her many virtues and that she in return loved him as an angel of god what need to affirm so unquestionable a fact saint jerome saint augustine saint gregory saint bernard and all the most notable servants of god have had special friendships which in no wise hindered their perfection st paul in describing evil men says that they were without natural affection i e without friendship and st thomas in common with other philosophers acknowledges that friendship is a virtue and he certainly means individual friendships because he says that we cannot bestow perfect friendship on many persons so we see that the highest grace does not lie in being without friendships but in having none which are not good holy and true end of part three chapter nineteen part three chapter twenty of introduction to the devout life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org introduction to the devout life by saint francis de sales part three chapter twenty of the difference between true and false friendships take notice my child that the honey of heraclium which is so poisonous altogether resembles that which is wholesome 
and there is great danger of mistaking one for the other or of mixing them, for the virtue of one would not counteract the harmfulness of the other. We must be on our guard not to be deceived in making friendships, especially between persons of the opposite sexes, for not unfrequently Satan deludes those who love one another. They may begin with a virtuous affection, but if discretion be lacking, frivolity will creep in, and then sensuality, till their love becomes carnal. Even in spiritual love there is a danger if people are not on the watch, although it is not so easy to be deluded therein, inasmuch as the very purity and transparency of spiritual affection show Satan's stains more promptly. Consequently, when he seeks to interpose, he does it stealthily, and strives to insinuate impurity almost imperceptibly. You may distinguish between worldly friendship and that which is good and holy, just as one distinguishes that poisonous honey from what is good. It is sweeter to the taste than ordinary honey, owing to the aconite infused. And so worldly friendship is profuse in honeyed words, passionate endearments, commendations of beauty and sensual charms, while true friendship speaks a simple, honest language, lauding not save the grace of God, its one only foundation. That strange honey causes giddiness, and so false friendship upsets the mind, makes its victim to totter in the ways of purity and devotion, inducing affected mincing looks, sensual caresses, inordinate sightings, petty complaints of not being loved, slight but questionable familiarities, gallantries, embraces, and the like, which are sure precursors of evil, whereas true friendship is modest and straightforward in every glance, loving and pure in caresses, has no sighs save for heaven, no complaints save that God is not loved sufficiently. That honey confuses the sight, and worldly friendship confuses the judgment, so that men think themselves right while doing evil, and assume their excuses and pretexts to be valid reasoning. They fear the light and love darkness, but true friendship is clear-sighted and hides nothing, rather seeks to be seen of good men. Lastly, this poisonous honey leaves an exceeding bitter taste behind, and so false friendship turns to evil desires, upbraidings, slander, deceit, sorrow, confusion, and jealousies, too often ending in downright sin. But pure friendship is always the same, modest, courteous, and loving, knowing no change save an increasingly pure and perfect union, a type of the blessed friendships of heaven. When young people indulge in looks, words, or actions which they would not like to be seen by their parents, husbands, or confessors, it is a sure sign that they are damaging their conscience and their honor. Our Lady was troubled when the angel appeared to her in human form, because she was alone, and he spoke to her with flattering, although heavenly words. O Saviour of the world, if purity itself fears an angel in human shape, how much more need that our impurity should fear men, although they take the likeness of an angel, if they speak words of earthliness and sensuality. End of Part 3 Chapter 20Part 3, Chapter 21 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 3, Chapter 21 Remedies Against Evil Friendships. How are you to meet the swarm of foolish attachments, triflings, and undesirable inclinations which beset you? By turning sharply away, and thoroughly renouncing such vanities, flying to the Saviour's cross and clasping his crown of thorns to your heart, so that these little foxes may not spoil your vines. Beware of entering into any manner of treaty with the enemy, do not delude yourself by listening to him while intending to reject him. For God's sake, my daughter, be firm on all such occasions. The heart and ear are closely allied, 
and just as you would vainly seek to check the downward course of a mountain torrent, so difficult will you find it to keep the smooth words which enter in at the ear from finding their way down into the heart. Als Mion says, what indeed Aristotle denies, that the goat breathes through its ears, not its nostrils. I know not whether this be so, but one thing I know, that our heart breathes through the ear, and that while it exhales its own thoughts through the mouth, and that while it exhales its own thoughts through the mouth, it inhales those of others by the ear. Let us then carefully guard our ears against evil words, which would speedily infect the heart. Never hearken to any indiscreet conversation whatsoever. Never mind if you seem rude or uncourteous in rejecting all such. Always bear in mind that you have dedicated your heart to God, and offered your love to Him, so that it were sacrilege to deprive Him of one particle thereof. Do you rather renew the offering continually by fresh resolutions, entrenching yourself therein as in a fortress, cry out to God, He will succour you, and His love will shelter you, so that all your love may be kept for Him only? If, unhappily, you are already entangled in the nets of any unreal affection, truly it is hard to set you free. But place yourself before His divine majesty, acknowledge the depth of your wretchedness, your weakness and vanity, and then with all the earnestness of purpose you can muster, arrest the budding evil, abjure your own empty promises, and renounce those you have received, and resolve with a firm, absolute will never again to indulge in any trifling or dallying with such matters. If you can remove from the object of your unworthy affection, it is most desirable to do so. He who has been bitten by a viper cannot heal his wound in the presence of another suffering from the like injury, and so one bitten with a false fancy will not shake it off while near to his fellow victim. Change of scene is very helpful in quieting the excitement and restlessness of sorrow or love. St. Ambrose tells a story in his second book on penitence of a young man who, coming home after a long journey, quite cured of a foolish attachment, met the unworthy object of his former passion, who stopped him, saying, Do you not know me? I am still myself. That may be, was the answer, but I am not myself. So thoroughly and happily was he changed by absence. And St. Augustine tells us how, after the death of his dear friend, he soothed his grief by leaving Tagaste and going to Carthage. But what is he to do who cannot try this remedy? To such, I would say, abstain from all private intercourse, all tender glances and smiles, and from every kind of communication which can feed the unholy flame. If it be necessary to speak at all, express clearly and tersely the eternal renunciation on which you have resolved. I say unhesitatingly to whosoever has become entangled in any such worthless love affairs, cut it short, break it off, do not play with it or pretend to untie the knot, cut it through, tear it asunder. There must be no dallying with an attachment which is incompatible with the love of God. But, you ask, after I have thus burst the chains of my unholy bondage, will no traces remain, and shall I not still carry the scars on my feet, that is, in my wounded affections? Not so, my child. If you have attained a due abhorrence of the evil, in that case all you will feel is an exceeding horror of your unworthy affection, and all appertaining thereto. No thought will linger in your breast concerning it, save a true love of God. Or if, by reason of the imperfection of your repentance, any evil inclinations still hover round you, seek such a mental solitude as I have already described, retire into it as much as possible, and then by repeated efforts and ejaculations renounce your evil desires, abjure them heartily, read pious books more than is your wont, go more frequently to confession and communion, tell your director simply and humbly all that tempts and troubles you, if you can, 
or at all events take counsel with some faithful wise friend. And never doubt but that God will set you free from all evil passions if you are steadfast and devout on your part. Perhaps you will say that it is unkind, ungrateful, thus pitilessly to break off a friendship. Surely it were a happy unkindness which is acceptable to God, but of a truth, my child, you are committing no unkindness, rather conferring a great benefit on the person you love, for you break his chains as well as your own, and although at the moment he may not appreciate his gain, he will do so by and by, and will join you in thanksgiving. Thou, Lord, hast broken my bonds in sunder. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of the Lord. End of Part 3 Chapter 21Part 3, Chapter 22 of Introduction to the Devout Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Part 3, Chapter 22. Further Advice Concerning Intimacies. Friendship demands very close correspondence between those who love one another, otherwise it can never take root or continue. And together with the interchange of friendship, other things imperceptibly glide in, and the mutual giving and receiving of emotions and inclinations take place, especially when we esteem the object of our love very highly, because then we so entirely open our heart to him, that his influence rules us altogether, whether for good or evil. The bees which make that oriental honey of which I spoke seek to gather naught save honey, but with it they suck up the poisonous juices of the aconite on which they light. So here, my child, we must bear in mind what our Saviour said about putting our money to the exchangers. We must seek to make a good exchange, not receiving bad money and good alike, and learning to distinguish that which is valuable from what is worthless, since scarcely any one is free from some imperfection, nor is there any reason why we should adopt all our friend's faults, as well as his friendship. Of course we should love him notwithstanding his faults, but without loving those faults. True friendship implies an interchange of what is good, not what is evil. As men who drag the river Tagus sift the gold from its sands and throw the latter back upon the shore, so true friends should sift the sand of imperfections and reject it. St. Gregory Nazianzen tells us how certain persons who loved and admired St. Basil were led to imitate even his external blemishes, his slow, abstracted manner of speaking, the cut of his beard, and his peculiar gait. And so we see husbands and wives, children, friends, who, by reason of their great affection for one another, acquire, either accidentally or designedly, many foolish little ways and tricks peculiar to each. This ought not to be, for every one has enough imperfections of their own without adding those of anybody else, and friendship requires no such thing. On the contrary, it rather constrains us to help one another in getting rid of all sorts of imperfections. Of course we should bear with our friends' infirmities, but we should not encourage them, much less copy them. Of course I am speaking of imperfections only, for as to sins, we must neither imitate or tolerate these in our friends. That is but a sorry friendship, which would see a friend perish and not try to save him would watch him dying of an abscess without daring to handle the knife of correction which would save him. True and living friendship cannot thrive amid sin. There is a tradition that the salamander extinguishes any fire into which it enters, and so sin destroys friendship. Friendship will banish a casual sin by brotherly correction, but if the sin be persistent, friendship dies out. It can only live in a pure atmosphere. Much less can true friendship ever lead anyone into sin, 
our friend becomes an enemy if he seeks to do so and deserves to lose our friendship and there is no surer proof of the hollowness of friendship than its profession between evildoers if we love a vicious person our friendship will be vicious too it will be like those to whom it is given those who draw together for mere temporal profit have no right to call their union friendship it is not for love of one another that they unite but for love of gain there are two sayings in holy scripture on which all christian friendship should be built that of the wise man whoso feareth the lord shall direct his friendship aright and that of saint james the friendship of the world is enmity with god End of part 3, chapter 22